This is More Money with economist Steve Moore. Now, Steve Moore. Welcome back, folks. This is the More Money Show. This is Steve Moore. Speaking of people who are absolute pros in the financial market, some of the wise, wisest people on this planet in terms of how to invest your money, I turn to my good friend, David Bonson. David Bonson is also the author of one of my favorite new books. You got to get this book, folks. It, and you, it's, it's a fun read, and you can kind of just pick it up and read sections of it. It's called There's No Free Lunch, 250 Economic Truths. And I, I always joke with David that I put it by my bedside, and I read it at night. And that's not because it's a cure for insomnia. It's because I always – I like it because there's these little nuggets of economic wisdom that I – every time I read it, I find some great quote by a Milton Friedman or Adam Smith or – some great businessman. Uh, and so it's fantastic. That again, the title of that book, because you can get it on Amazon, is there no, there's no free lunch, 250 economic truths. And by the way, you all, I think most of you know that that saying there's no free lunch comes from one of my favorite, favorite economists of all time, Milton Friedman. So David, thanks so much for joining. By the way, David Bonson and I oftentimes appear together on Sean Hannity's radio show, and I always learn so much from him. So I was, uh, I'm so glad that you're joining us. So, David, let's start with this. I, I'm befuddled by this economy. I really am. I can't quite figure out where it's going. I can't figure out where the stock market is going. And I think I speak for a lot of our listeners who are in the same position. Um, you know, there are some parts of the economy that st- seem strong, like the labor market and then other areas. Uh, and, you know, it looks like inflation is getting better, but then we see reports that energy prices are rising again and so on. And what is an investor to do? Because I just been wrong. You know, I thought we might see a recession in the first quarter of 2023, as many people did. I think you were a little bit more bullish than others. But where do you see things headed? Well, I'll, I want to speak to the fact that it's confusing and befuddling for <laughs> even a smart economic guy like you, let alone yeah. for how many people out there just trying to make heads and tails of what's going on. Yeah. Steve, I think that for somebody like me, who is a political conservative and a devout Reaganite and has right. been my whole life, right. that there is, there is an irresistible temptation to associate our politics with what is happening in the economy. Yeah, we do. And I apologize for that connection problem. Hopefully we're better now. And, and so, Steve, what I was trying to say, I really think it's such an important topic, is when we are somehow able to just put aside – expectations of how politics are going to affect the economy right. and and mm-hmm. really evaluate things more objectively, it does okay. help. And I think it helps for the future, too, because, see, I think Barack Obama's policies were disastrous, and yet the stock market was up eight out of eight years since <laughs> he was president. And, and yeah. I think that, um, that, that there were sometimes have been really good presidents, and you've had the stock market down when they were president, because there are things like monetary policy, things like geopolitics things like, um, you know, lagging effects. It could all affect things. President Mm -hmm. Biden has benefited from the tax policies of President Trump that you all passed. There Mm -hmm. is a huge lagging impact from corporate taxes having gone down. There's huge profitability from the investment that was made when we repatriated foreign profits back on shore. And and so that's But the other element is just put aside bad politics. This is a capitalism. This is the American economy that is largely, right. but not perfectly, but largely driven by the profit motive. And that stuff works. And so we shouldn't be surprised when things are going sometimes better than expected economically. So I just add to what you're saying that, you know, obviously, uh, I, I mean, I think when Biden came into office, uh, when he, you know, his, his great, his line that he uses all the time, oh, the economy was a catastrophe and I fixed everything. It was teed up, wasn't it, David? I mean, COVID was coming to an end. Businesses were reopening. People were going back to work. And, you know, so I think there's part of that too, is this, this momentum that was built up from having the, you know, once the economy was shut down for a year and a half, it seemed like it was ready to explode. Yes, the only president that I can think of in recent history who could say I inherited a terrible economy 
was Obama right. when he came in in the middle of the financial. That's true. Crisis, yes. You know, yes. and even 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 President Bush uh, Jr. took over uh, a pretty strong economy from yeah. Bill Clinton, though, though, obviously, dot com had blown up. Right. There were a lot of other really positive things happening. And then we had 9-11 and a minor recession and some other things. But but, Steve, I guess what I'm saying is right now it's more than just jobs that are healthy. We do have a pretty strong, a pretty strong business atmosphere. Small right. businesses are hurting more than they should, but right. there is a, a decent amount of investment in, into the future. And, and some things are going to get a lot better in the future. I don't know if it'll be after uh, 2024 or not, but I really think a lot. There's going to be a big capex boom where we have a lot of American investment onshore in some of our supply chain. So you think you're that's a pretty bullish statement you're making, David. And, you know, I've been saying that I I, I just feel like things are off track you know, for the economy. And but as you know, if you look at the recent polling, you know, about 70 percent of Americans kind of agree with me that there's something people are nervous about what we're doing in Washington. And I want to just go back to your point, because I, I agree with almost everything that you said, but I, I also believe that policy matters, right? I mean, you know, if you sure. get the policies right, you can get a lot more, you know, reduce regulation, encourage capitalism, encourage entrepreneurship, uh, get government regulations off of the back of our businesses. So I want to make sure I understand what you're saying. You sound like you think things are going to get better over the last next year or two. Well, maybe two. I do suspect still that there is about a 50 yeah. percent chance of a recession at the end of okay. this year, beginning beginning part of next year. And why is that? Why? 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 Correct. Sorry to interrupt, but why? What, what makes you nervous about a recession? In other words, why? What would be the trigger for that? If the Fed is to continue over tightening above and beyond what is necessary, you know, right, right. now, Steve, we have zero percent inflation for the last nine months. If you X out energy, which is not monetary, and shelter, yep. which is dead wrong, dead wrong. Uh, the, the idea that we have 8.2 percent inflation in housing right now would be news to anybody trying to sell their house, I assure you. And, 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 <laughs> OK, so, I wa- and so hold on. I, again, I just want to I'm sorry to interrupt because, you know, what you're saying is so important. And a lot of us are not brilliant financial um, experts like you are. So would you advise the. Fed not to raise rates because uh, there's you know most people think they'll raise rates again. Do you think that's should they should or shouldn't? I definitely think they shouldn't. I do think it appears they will. I don't think they go put four Fed governors out to talk this way. Even though right. three of them, by the way, three of them do right. not have a vote. But Fed four Fed governors have said we should. The futures market is pricing that they will. So we are assume they're going to do it one more time. And here's the bad news. For our economy okay. and good news, good yeah. news for for people who hold risk assets. Um, well, all it means is that they're going to have to end up cutting rates sooner and more heavily. In other words, they're just playing both sides of the extreme. They left rates too low for too long, and that was right. I think exacerbating what will become the best, meaning they're going to see worse impact than is necessary in commercial real estate or credit markets or things. Like that. And then what will the Fed do, Steve? We've seen it our whole adult lives. You and I both have never lived through a period where the second something mm-hmm. goes wrong, the Fed doesn't rush out to start cutting interest rates <laughs> right, and then leaving, right. them, leaving them too low for too long. Imagine yeah. we never went to zero, or maybe we went to zero just for a few months during COVID, you know, but then immediately start, sort of normalized. Uh, if we hadn't gone to zero and we hadn't come all the way up right now to five, what if they just yep. kept it at about two and a half, about two and a half right. percent the last couple of years? We wouldn't have a boom and we wouldn't have a bust. But but then I would say, you know, to play the devil's advocate, then we're going to have, you know, persistently high inflation, which is a big, big problem. And and I think that's it, where there is disagreement with me, with, okay. with a lot yep. of my friends on the right. Yeah. And I don't like that because generally I agree with my heroes, but I disagree with a couple of them on this one. Um, okay. I don't think energy price inflation is Jay Powell. I think it's America uh, taking a policy that we're not going to use our own assets, our own strengths. It's but, something but, you and I have okay, talked about so, with Sean Hannity. Yeah, well, this is a good discussion because, okay, I accept what you're saying, but still the policy itself is going to reduce the supply of energy, right? Because we're not – he's basically saying we're not going to produce it, and that is going to raise the price. 
and therefore yeah. the Fed has to doesn't doesn't the Fed have to counter that? Well, how does the Fed using the interest rate bring supply of energy online? <laughs> well, good all, point. <laughs> all good that point. the Fed can do is try to manipulate demand either up or down with the cost of capital, Steve. Well, there has been no excessive demand of energy. We're still trying to basically use about the same amount of oil and gas we were using before COVID. The difference is we're we're making that. So you're you're sounding pretty bullish on the U.S. economy and the market right now. Am Am I misdiagnosing what you're saying? In other words, for our listeners who are investors, stay in the market. But I would not recommend... Staying in the market as an investor, if what that means to you is overloading on the S&P 500, which is primarily Apple, Amazon, Google, and Facebook. Mm -hmm. In other words, I think five, six, seven technology companies is a very bad way to invest when they're trading at 20, 30, 40 times earnings. So even though I'm bullish on risk assets because I'm bullish on free enterprise and bullish on the profit motive, I do want people to be more selective. Got it. And so uh, I wrote a column uh, this week with it was in the New York Post about <clears throat> the Biden tax plan, David. And I looked at all the new tiers of taxation on investment that Biden has proposed. And those, as I think, you know, include he wants to raise the corporate tax rate from 21 to 28 percent. He wants to raise the capital gains tax from I think we're at 23.8% today. He wants to raise that up to 44%. He wants to tax unrealized capital gains. In other words, for those who don't know what that means, it means like if you have an asset, a stock or a farm or something, and it appreciates in, in value, you'd have to pay a tax on that whether you sold it or not. Um, and and then when you add in state and local taxes and so on, I came to the conclusion that under the Biden plan, David, you could you could uh, let's say you invest a million dollars in a company and you make a million dollars, you'd pay an 80 percent tax on that. Now, so my question to you is, what is that going to do to investment? What's that going to do to the stock market if it were to were to happen? But see, you just said the key words in the last part of your sentence, if it <laughs> were to happen. And it's right. not. It's not going to happen. That's the right. key. You see, so on one hand, if Steve Moore and David Bonson, who agree on most things, are making a list of pros and cons, right. Steve, Steve and David both put Joe Biden in the list of cons, but then David puts in his list of pros Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, and Alexander <laughs> Hamilton. Right. Be- well, because I we think you got a good point power. there. <laughs> you got me on that one. And so you're you're basically saying fundamentally this is a healthy – system that we have. You don't believe that capital. See, I'm worried that capitalism in, is in danger in America. And uh, you seem to yeah. to think that we're going to that some of these really um, dingbat ideas are not going to happen. And I think you're probably right about that. But, but I do want to offer the kind of uh, the, the uh, counter to that, because mine is yeah. not a Pollyannish optimism. I'm a happy warrior, but there's something right. to be a warrior about here. Our biggest threat to capitalism, Steve, is not Joe Biden. Our biggest threat to capitalism is culture. It's Harvard. It's the UC California college system. I agree. It's the public high school system, K through 12 teachers unions. Okay, we have to vigilantly defend free enterprise um, ideologically, philosophically, personally. Yes. Ultimately, people at Kristen Cinema and Joe Manchin dealt with Joe Biden. Okay, but what you guys like you and me and Larry Kudlow have to do is right. we have to make sure other people in America keep hearing the positive news of free enterprise, because that's where we'll lose the war, not in one election, but in one or two decades. That's where we have to keep fighting. Well, you're, what you're saying is so important because I just saw a survey that came out within the last six months or so that more college students describe themselves as socialists rather than capitalists. That's that's scary. Yeah, and the good news in that is, as I've looked at that stuff deeper, they don't yeah. mean they like socialism. They don't like socialism. They hate what they think of as capitalism. They right. don't like. Uh, they don't like cronyism. And 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 so when I defend free enterprise, by the way, Steve, I, I actually don't even really like the word capitalism. I mean, it was sort of Karl Marx's way of kind of um, poking at us because he, because yes. our ism is not, is not just capital. It's, it's people, it's ideas, right. it, it's freedom. Right. That's why it's I freedom. think a free yeah. society, a market economy, free enterprise, yes. these are better free terms. Enterprise. Yep. Human, 
the human flourishing we stand behind. But where I am negative, where I am really concerned is debt. It's, it's national debt. That's a thing okay. that I hate to say it. I'm so sorry for my Republican friends, but it's a bipartisan problem that we have overspent for 25 years. And now I think that we have to deal with the um, impact of $31 trillion of national debt and how that puts downward pressure on growth. Uh, luckily for us Americans, our uh, society, our engine of growth has been able to keep up better than Japan's has. But look, we should not be getting one to two percent economic growth. We, I mean, in yeah, one year with pathetic. President Trump, because of the brilliant tax cuts, we got up to three percent, up to three. We mm-hmm. averaged three point one percent for 70 years. OK, mm-hmm. we should be doubling our economic growth. Which OK, so more jobs, more opportunity. Give me do you have a couple more minutes, David? I don't want to abuse your time, but uh, this is a fascinating conversation. And I wanted to ask you a few yeah. more questions. So do you have I'll time for that? You. Yep. You okay. bet. So um, I'm going to ask you a question that I used to, you know, I've, I've been lucky in my life. I knew Milton Friedman. I, I actually once met. Friedrich Hayek and, you know, Thomas Sowell. So I, I've, I've been really blessed in, in the brilliance of many of the people I've met in my lifetime, the Bill Buckley's of the world. And I used to always ask, especially people like Milton Friedman, what are the three things that we should do to increase the prosperity of the country? And I want to ask you that question. If you could wave a wand, David, and you could make three changes to the country and our policies right now, what would you do that would generate, uh, you know, more wealth, more prosperity, more jobs for America. The number one thing, the number one thing is an immediate, vigilant tackling of national debt that doesn't allocate so much of our resources as a country to the public sector and debt service, but reallocates to the private sector where there is a smarter, more knowledgeable, more opportunistic allocation of resources. And so there- I love that one. What's number two? Number two- would be a vigilant determination for energy independence. We should be it. exporting oil and gas. And then number three is yep. a, a subsidiarity, a federalism, allow so much of the regulatory issues that we deal with to be at the state and local level, not the federal oh, level. I love that. You know what that does? It that. gets rid of a lot of regulations because at the state and local level, we won't put up with it. I love that. You know, when I asked Milton Friedman that, you know, back 30 years ago, right before he died, you know what his three things were pretty close to yours. The first was cut government spending, (laughs) which is basically what you're saying, you know, divert those resources to the private sector. His second was free trade, which probably won't surprise you. And his uh, third was school choice, because, as you know, he devoted so much of his life to education freedom, which, by the way, we're making great progress on that issue. I don't know if you know been following this david we sure are. we're allowing Absolutely. more and more kids around the country to have more choices with education okay final question and then we'll let you go uh my question for the day for our listeners is do you like or not like what uh kevin mccarthy has put forward in his plan to deal with this debt ceiling issue and i, I think you're probably aware of this but there's four or five components he wants to put a one percent cap on government spending he wants to claw back some of that unspent COVID money, which is in the hundreds of billions of dollars. He wants to cancel the student loan bailout and he wants to not hire IRS, the, you know, $40 billion more for the IRS. Um, and I think I might have missed, oh, and he has the work requirements, you know, for welfare. And I wonder, you know, of those ideas, you know, what, what do you think of those? I like all of them. I, I, there are some who would say, why even allow 1% increase in spending? And <laughs> I'm it, there. You know. Yeah. But, we, you know, we have to deal with the politically possible and the politically yeah. realistic. And I love the idea, too, that he's not trying to beat something with nothing. He's not saying we're not going to raise the debt limit, but we're not going to pass our own budget. You know, Boehner right. got the right. sequester concessions out of Obama because the House GOP passed a debt limit increase. And, yes. and that's what McCarthy's looking yes. to do. So I, I theoretically like it all. Would you and I both find a couple of things we wanted to tweak? I'm sure we would. But conceptually, I like where it's headed. Yeah, you and I think alike. That's why I love having you on the show. And I always learn so much from you. That's David Bonson. And his book, again, is There's No Free Lunch, 250 Economic Truths. Folks, you got to get it. You know, you can... Just have a lot of fun reading it. I learn so much from it when I pick it up and just flip through it and find wonderful quotes from great, great, great economists going back to Adam Smith. Um, David, have a great weekend. Thanks so much for joining. 